Hello, I'm Anthony Brandt. I'm here with my old friend Hans von den von de Bovenkamp. And with, this is another in a long series I've done of conversations with artists and writers from the Hamptons or in the Hamptons. Uh, Hans is one of my favorites. He's done, I would say, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of sculptures of various kinds and shapes. And you'll see them all over the Hamptons because he's gotten commissions from various local places. And here he is. This is Hans von den Bovenkamp. Von de Bovenkamp. I gotta get that Thanks. name right. It's great to see you, Hans. Thank you. It's been Good a while. Life. And what are you working on now? Um, I am working, I have in my studio, busy with two smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, I just installed a large sculpture in Las Vegas, right, in front of the beautiful uh, cultural center called the Smith Center. And uh, I've just recently decided that I don't want to do very large works anymore. They're no. very, they're hard to make and dangerous because it's a lot of metal. Right, right. And blessed, we have had no major accidents. Yes. Actually, I interviewed somebody, Richard Serra, once, who had lost two workers when he was constructing one of his giant steel sculptures, and they, they had died when something collapsed and fell on them. So that's a legitimate concern. And you do very large sculptures. You do them 30, 40 feet high sometimes. Yes. And they're very impressive. And they strike me as having about them a kind of energy that is focused in the piece, thrusting this way, twisting that way, and wrapping around things. And it's, uh, it's, it's, all, it's almost dramatic, let me put it that way. You feel, you, Am I making sense to you? Yes, no. You you have a very good perspective. Most people don't even see that. Really? Or you don't talk about it. Uh -huh. We're coming to the ends of our careers, both of us. We're both in our 80s. And this is probably the last but one interview I'm going to be doing. And I'm glad I'm doing it with you because I've known you for a long time. We've had wonderful conversations over lunch sometimes. And uh, it's been a pleasure to know you. Well, thank you. So what else is happening in your life? Well, uh, as I've gotten older, my power of a teenager or middle-aged person has subsided and fortunately I have uh, assistants they have been with me for 25 years uh -huh. uh, and it is a, a very focused business and uh, you know when you have I've had as many as 25 assistants wow. and there's a lot of coordination involved yeah so I have a pad on my bed with a ballpoint with a little light in it. And in the middle of the night when I have a thought, that's actually when I do most of my thinking, when I wake up and then I make little doodles. Mm -hmm. that, and then in the morning I transfer those to more visible, visual uh, compositions. Uh, but I told you that my work is mostly influenced by mythology yes, and by nature. Right. I am, uh, as you are, we look at, I look at trees and I'm always in awe of a tree. Yes. How there are thousands, millions of trees and they're all different. That's right. I know the trees on my property pretty well and I greet them in the morning as I walk to my studio. Uh -huh. And because uh, I'm surrounded by them, you know, they're yeah. my 
extended family. And with the sculpture, it's been a very long, long journey. Mm -hmm. I started sculpting when I was about 18, and uh, that's all I have done. Before I was 18, from 17 to 18, when I, uh, I immigrated with my family to Canada, and my father said, well, why don't you get a job? So let me try it. I had in one year a dozen jobs. And a dozen? I, yeah. I was from dog walker to mailman to schlepper uh -huh. at a building site. And finally, I became a manager of a bank. Right. And that was very boring. Yes, yes. Uh, but it was a guaranteed paycheck. And then very slowly, I made, first I made products. I designed lamps, uh, influenced by Isamu Noguchi, right. the right. shapes. And I did these in college. And um, it, it became very successful. I was uh, in American Express catalogs, George Jensen's. Wow. Uh, 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 Noguchi is, is very organic. Yeah. He's, he's very... And the fountains, uh, I made extra money, more money than I needed. I never had that before. I was always short. Mm -hmm. Now I make more money. And I said, well, maybe I should go to the next step. And then I began to make fountains. And the fount I had one guy working for me and who was an engineer. And mm -hmm. if I asked the people who worked for me, they all had glamorous education. But he thought this was so unique. Mm -hmm. you know, not many jobs as an artist assistant. And the fountains I sold all over the world uh, by very glamorous collectors, very famous people. And I was blessed to meet many of these people who introduced me to other mm -hmm. people. And the fountains were kind of like a Rube Goldberg contraptions. The, you know, we had a, a reservoir of water and then you could plug it in and then the water went to the top and cascaded down and made wheels move, made arms yeah. rock. And it was, it was a lot of fun. But it, frankly, it became a job. Yeah. And the lamps, I ended up as one of the 20 best designs of the year in Life magazine. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and all of a sudden my career took a quantum yeah. leap. Publicity is very, has been very important. I've been incredibly blessed. Also, you know, most artists, when they begin making sculpture, they, it's very costly. Mm -hmm. For example, a piece of metal, one square foot, an eighth of an inch thick, cost ten dollars. Really? So when I make a cube, only a small cube, that has already sixty dollars worth of material. Yeah. And then you have to double it with the labor. Right. But it's only one shape of maybe of my sculpture of thirty shapes. I, then I began to make sculpture of found objects. Right. Uh, because it was cheaper. You know, a little can crushed by a car. Uh, the blocks that held the, the rail together of a railroad. Uh -huh. And uh, they had two holes in them. They were about maybe 10 inches by six inches. They had two holes where the nails were to hold the rail in place. Right. And they had thrown them all to the side. So I had thousands of these things that I brought home. They were heavy. And the holes were for, for, for structural reason. But then I changed it. I made them into square heads. Square heads. And they had the two eyes already, and I put eyebrows on it, and I had them play violins, and <laughs> businessmen with a suitcase. It was yeah. hilarious. It was very creative. And people would buy a half a dozen at a time, different ones. Yeah. And then I got bored with that after a year or two. And I said, now I want to make sculpture. 
Robert Bartkeller sculpture, and I studied a lot in books uh, to see other artists' work, and then I looked at nature, and in nature there was so much beauty, and you could take a little part of a tree, and that could be a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I was twisting and turning, and basically uh, talking about what the weather was like. If there was a strong wind for three months, a branch would move this way. Mm -hmm. And so it was very organic. And then also mythology was very important, because in mythology, any story is okay. Mm -hmm. And the, and it had to do a lot with uh, spirit things, spirit ideas. Uh, and mythology is unending. You have, I, I have dictionaries of mythology that are full of every country or every region has its own mythology. That's correct. And yet, you know, a person like Joseph Campbell, who was so mm -hmm. respected as a mythologist, yes. uh, I met him several times, and he came to look at my work, and I said, what should I be doing? He said, follow your bliss. I said, okay, that sounds easy. It was not so easy, because as an artist, you try to create a language, mm -hmm. and you create your own alphabet. And as my sculpture my the sculpture journey began to expand, and I became more proficient, and I could afford durable material, lasting. Like my sculptures in bronze and stainless steel, they'll last for thousands of years. Right. But they're hard to work, and they're costly to purchase. And first, I made cutouts. Mm -hmm. like a drawing, and I drew on the metal or on the cardboard, and then my assistants would cut it out. And then I would create three dimension with painting. And then later on I said, no, sculpture has to be three-dimensional, really three-dimensional. Then I began to make shapes that were hollow. Mm -hmm. And I made them, I'd make drawings, and then I would make the drawings larger on cardboard, and my assistants would cut them and transform them at, into metal. Mm -hmm. And then we would begin to curve the metal, so it had already a three-dimensional feeling. Mm -hmm. And then we would put six shapes, cut out shapes together, into one voluminous shape. And by putting a curve, and my, my sculptures became larger and larger. I've done sculptures uh, 40 feet tall. You're right, I've seen uh, pictures of them. Yeah. yeah. And always got huge publicity. And then I realized most sculptors are making small things that go in the house. Mm -hmm. And since I had studied architecture, I would see a sculpture as a landmark or as an tulip in your lapel for a mm -hmm. decoration. And so the sculptures became l large and could relate to skyscrapers. And then people say, where is the building? I said, well, you know where the red sculptures? Oh yeah, that we know. I said, well, that is 11,202 corporate drive. They said, no, we know the sculpture. We don't know what these numbers. <laughs> so it became another dimension, actually, mm -hmm. about of, of awareness. And what I noticed by curving, sometimes, you know, nature and your thinking really go parallel or even intersect. Uh, I think then you have really achieved a very sensitive dimension. And the, by the shapes having curved, so then as, the su as these were large sculptures outside, the sun would move yeah. and would move the light over a curved plane. Mm -hmm. It couldn't light the, light the whole thing, but it could just a little bit. So you could actually, if you stood really still for hours, 
you could see the light move over the sculpture. Right. So a sculpture, when you when one is complete, and you have it outside, it really reflects the nature. If it rains, you see it right away. Mm -hmm. The color changes from wetness. When the sun is shining, you have the reflection of light and shadow. And those two were constantly shifting right. and really made it very three-dimensional. And when I make sculpture, I try very much to keep walking around it, around it, because most sculptures are made frontally. Yeah. They have a, basically a silhouette or cut out, and then they put depth to it. Mm -hmm. But a real sculpture, all four sides should be equally interesting. Yes. No, and I agree. I that was a huge I agree with challenge. That. Yeah. And then the last 10 years, and well, one drawback of sculpture, you get invited for a show. They can't afford to buy it because a painting is one twentieth the price. And they say, can we borrow it? And then I would put it on a trailer and I would drive 20 hours and bring it to Chicago and I would be in a show with other artists. And then I would drive back and two months later I would drive back again and pick it up. So <laughs> it was a lot of... Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. Well, I, it, I think that's one reason why so much sculpture is done or bought by institutions as markers either outside or inside their doors or wherever they might want to put them. But the institutions can afford the sculpture. Now, my wife and I spent a month in Rome a oh. few years ago. We saw a lot of Bernini, Berninis. Uh, Rome is full of Berninis. And all I could think was, these are not only absolutely gorgeous, but you have to be rich <laughs> to, to buy one or to have one made. And uh, I realized that this was done largely for church patrons, you know, cardinals and bishops and so on. And uh, I remember walking around one of Bernini's sculptures, and I think it's the Rape of Persephone. And he found a way to carve into the marble the hand of the rapist who was Pluto to make in an indentation into the flesh. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. And that gave me a sense of how sculpture is supposed to work. Now, when I talked to Richard Serra, <laughs> he, he said very disparagingly, sculpture is what people bump into when they back up to look to a pa at a painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, well, that's interesting, but it's not really the case. And, and more to it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but your sculpture is often monumental. It really is made for a large place. And I understand and appreciate the work that has to go into that. The amount of labor the sheer labor that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And I think you, as you, as, as you said earlier, that you have to be a younger man to be able to do this, or even to want to do it. I'm a writer, I don't face those problems. But, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I, was, I was telling you earlier what I, what I saw in your work and partly it's, it's the forces, the, the thrust, and often the thrust bends and curves around and makes curves. And that strikes me as, as it's, it's not quite abstract because it's, there's a real sense of power in them. And that something is going on inside 
even though it's an inanimate object, that makes them feel so strong and so focused in a way that it's sometimes whimsical. Uh, anyway, it just feels like it's good. Thank you. And it is good. But you know, if you have a good source for ideas, yeah. like nature and mythology are so rich and so huge. Right. In um, my latest sculptures, which are quite large, and where I've taken many shapes and piled them, that series is called Men Here. M-E-N-H-I-R, right. which means standing stone, right. vertically. Or, and I said, well, that's nice, but I cannot do the sculptures with a stone sticking out this far. So by making them hollow in metal and welding them, yeah. I could make very complex men hairs, more so than the people who invented the word men here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so w w what I loved earlier when you described that my sculpture goes vertical, then it goes sideways, then it curves around, that's really how you integrate all the, the alphabet and mm -hmm. create new words. Yeah. And um, also, structurally, it improves it. My sculptures are very strong. They don't easily break. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I'm very blessed by having <coughs> assistants who are very qualified and bona fide to do the work. So the craftsmanship is, from my perspective, pretty impeccable. Mm -hmm. And that is very important. This is, you can write a great story in literature, but the language has to be so Sometimes the language is more interesting than the story. That's, that's quite possible, right? Yeah, and that's fascinating. Yeah, I've yeah. read some real trashy books, but they're very well written. And the story didn't matter to me. Uh -huh. I just love the writing. You know, it's like a, like a song. Right. Except that you have a second al animal, a, a second uh, voice, yeah. let's say. Um, well, so, uh, Lorraine, and her, Lorraine is my wife, obviously, as you know. And uh, we went to Belize once. And we went to an archaeological dig where they were going into the Mayan ruins. And I actually saw them unearthing a stella, ancient stella thousand, two thousand years old, who knows. And they dug it up and there's all this carving on the face of it, which is pretty amazing stuff. And they have interpreted that. They have figured out how the language works. And again, it's about gods and heroes and the genealogy of this and that. And this, this kind of story that comes out of myth that is a myth is very powerful. Well, it also links history, right? you know, into the future. I remember uh, walking in the Yucatan right. by the Mayans uh, where they had lived. And you come to a spot and all of a sudden you feel energy coming out of the earth. Right. Uh, and the Mayans, when they found an energy spot, they would erect some shapes, mostly columns, mm -hmm. you know, men here, vertical stones. Then they built the plaza around it, and then they had all the merchants and the people lived beyond. So nowadays in America, a new city is formed by four gas stations and an intersection, and then they built a... Right houses around it. It's very interesting how it has shifted. Um, there is a lot of spirit energy in the earth.
Yes. There are about a half a dozen spots in the world, and I go to one of them in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of an organization called uh, Blue Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's an, uh, uh, an, uh, an, an other organization is called uh, the Omega Institute. And they're all uh, dealing with spirit and man uh, through yoga, through uh, mindful walking. Mm -hmm. you know, I have walked with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote about 60, 70 books, and he and I would hold hands, and he was a little man, and we would walk to no direction. And after a half an hour, he would walk very slowly, very consciously, and then he said, uh, well, I have to break the quiet. I said, fine. He said, what do you feel when you're walking? I said, well, about five minutes ago, I really strongly felt the foot, the bottom of the feet of the people on the other side of the earth <laughs> who were walking. You know, we were walking here, and they were walking <laughs> here. And I don't know how I came up with that, but it was really, there was a, a spirit connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been to India about a dozen times, and there are many uh, yeah. spirit connections. And I'm busy with a big project in Las Vegas right now. There was, an, uh, there was an, a casino, and there was a concert down below. And one guy killed about 80 people. Mm. And he wounded 1,500 people. My God. People now, they're still alive. They have one arm, one leg, and what have you. And I was asked uh, to come up with an idea for a memorial. Mm -hmm. And that is actually one of the projects I've worked on for the last year. But you know, like the World Trade Center did a memorial, and it took 13 years before they finally decided this is it. Mm. And that's how they gave the project. Mine is about three years old, mm -hmm. and I have, once a month there is a program just about this memorial, not about me, what, how they want it. They are learning how to create a world-class memorial, which I think I have designed. Uh, the memorial is not just a single object, it is a two-acre environment mm -hmm. where you walk mindfully. And it has an escalator to go down to a museum where people tell their stories of the yeah. event. And then it has a cafeteria. And it is built, finally, that makes me very happy. I always told them uh, uh, the grounds belong to a casino. And I said, you cannot put a, a casino on holy ground. And there are many Chinese who go to Las Vegas. Hundreds of thousands. Really? Yeah. Uh, they love Las Vegas. It's like a playground. Mm -hmm. It's a party town. Uh, we live outside in nature uh, by uh, Las Vegas. And uh, they would never go on a place where there would have been such a mass murder. Yeah. And so MGM, who owned the land, which is they get 10, 20 million dollars for an acre there for, to build a casino. They said, we're going to donate the two acres to the memorial. So that was my greatest reward, even if I don't build it. Yeah. Because that's the right spot. That's where you can still feel the spirit. There are people who claim when they go to the World Trade Center, they still hear people screaming. Really? Yeah, I knew, uh, I know uh, uh, another poet who has, uh, she wrote a poem a year before the World Trade Center event about people jumping or falling out of a very tall building. It was in the, the exact year before. And then it, the event came 
and she looked in her notes and she remembered something about it. And there it was, she had written a poem about that. There is spirit in the world. I once took, I went to a place called Downsville. Upstate? Yes. I, I lived in Downsville. Well. <laughs> <laughs> small yeah. world. Yeah, small world. And uh, I took acid for the first time, and the only time I ever took it, because I was writing a book about the mental health system. Oh. And I wanted to know what it felt like to be slightly crazy. Well, I didn't learn that, but as I was, <clears throat> I was drifting off into my own world, and I saw, there were three people there. I saw three ghosts, not ghosts, but spirits. They were about two feet off the ground, and they were talking to each other about the three of us. And I said, I must be hallucinating. <laughs> How is this possible? I can't be seeing these people. And uh, that's when I, I came away from that experience no longer afraid to die, number one. Number two, I came away from it Yes, there are things that we don't understand about the world and about what's going on in the world, in the other world. And there are more than one worlds. There are many worlds out there that we clue into. And this is one reason that I've been so fascinated by trees for such a long time. Because we, we live, like you do, surrounded by trees. We back up to a nature reserve, which is nothing but trees. Wow, beautiful. And our front yard consists almost entirely of, of trees, a whole bunch of mostly oak trees. Uh, and there's something about them that really appeals to me and, and sort of woke up my own creativity. I don't know where it comes from, but it felt very right and very strong. And I've been comfortable there ever since. I really felt I found the place for me. I love that you use the word energy. I think all things have energy. Yes. And I think I have met people who have died. I've met them when I exteriorized. I left my body and I spent time with them, but it was, was just energy. Mm -hmm. and it was just air, energy. But there was a language and a vision, and we communicated. I don't know. I didn't speak Dutch or English, you know, I was just thought. Before you could even say the word, the thought had already communicated yes. to the other spirit. And I, I agree with you that forests uh, have a lot of spirit. There is, because uh, some people talk about, they see light at the edge of life. Mm -hmm. And other people say they see darkness. And uh, it, th that's very interesting. And for me, um, I, uh, you had mentioned earlier psychedelics. I was very friendly with uh, Ram Das. Once spent a week alone with him mm -hmm. and Tim, Tim Leary, Timothy Leary. Those two gentlemen were into extraordinary visions, which is similar to religion. Yeah. Religion, uh, I don't know if all of this stuff exists, but why it is, you kind of project it very utopian. Mm -hmm. So if you can live towards utopia, that's a good, that's the right direction. Yeah, it's, a, it's the right direction, and as you say. And uh, I had long talks with them, and you know, we took the, the hallucinogenics uh, together, and then another form was ayahuasca. That oh, yeah, ayahuasca, the South American drug. South America. Yeah. I've, I've done a lot of that too. 
And the people say, Hans, you know, it's not good for you, those things. Those are people, experts who have never taken it. Right. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. I seem to be getting smarter as I get older, so. You, know. <laughs> you can't argue with that. Right. <laughs> no. And so I've been to India many times, and I've spent a lot of time with Buddhists. I'm, I'm a son of a Baptist minister, mm -hmm. but I think of myself as more as an unregistered Buddhist. Me too. Yeah? Yeah, because it is peaceful. It's peaceful. It's not warlike in any sense of the word. Yeah. They're not into war. And they're into, they're into... I don't think Putin is a Buddhist. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's not possible. But what was so great, you know, when I would be in India, I would see these Buddhists walking in their beautiful gowns, and I would say, where are you going? He said, well, we have a store for Buddhists that's outside of town, about an hour. I said, would you mind if I walked there with you? And there was a, a Buddhist shop. There were only half a dozen little buildings. They were packed with Buddhas and all things related. Mm -hmm. And my, I have in my house maybe 20 Buddhas. Yeah, I only have one. Yeah, and to me, when when I walk fast, then I see the Buddha, I said, oh, yes, excuse me, and I slow down my pace. Mm -hmm. So visually, they're very, they're there. Mm -hmm. And they're still teachers without words. Yes. Which is the greatest teacher. Yes. Because then you have to discover what they wanted to teach you. Right. And that's the best route. And, and it's the same in sculpture. Uh, I love doing places doing sculpture for places that have symbolism or significance. Mm -hmm. uh, and they usually are in isolated places. And so you have to put up something huge, otherwise some, nobody will see it. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, gosh, the Mayans were building pyramids and the Egyptians and people were stacking stones as markers. Mm -hmm. and. Those things were very, very influential. And if you're in a forest, you know, we look up to see the beautiful, right now, like this morning, the buds were this big. Yeah, yeah. And, but I often look on the ground, what is there? What has the tree shed? Mm -hmm. What is the, the impact of a tree, like a sculpture? You know, what do people get out of it? And so when I read mythology, then I find certain names. And everybody knows that name, but everybody has a different image. A little bit what was written seems to be the core of the story. But if you go beyond it, you know, uh, the Ganesh is an Indian right. sculpture. Yeah, I have one. And I have a human figure with an elephant head. Right. What a, that is real integration. Mm -hmm. There is no prejudice there. No. And so just looking at an object like that, that was made thousands of years ago, still carries significance today. Mm -hmm. Not to all, but to those who seek. Well, if you're sensitive to it, if you're open to it, you have to have an open mind no matter where you are or what you're doing. Uh, the example of that for me is Mark Twain, of all people. Mark Twain <clears throat> uh, did a tour around the world because he needed the money, and he was going to give lectures and all that stuff. Great. And he got to India. And you know, he's, a, he's an old white man at this point in his life. And he's grown up with black people. He's known black slaves. He's written about them. He got to India, and he couldn't believe. He was astonished by, first, the clothes they wore, which were so beautifully colorful. And clean. And clean. And the color of their, of their skin, which was sort of brown bronze, kind of, the, it had a shine about it. And he fell absolutely in love with India. 
to his own surprise because they treated him well. Uh, but more than that, he was stunned by the people and how gracious, gracious and generous they were. And he said something uh, that is now quoted on television once in a while. Travel is fatal <coughs> to prodigious and narrow-mindedness. And he's absolutely right about that. I sometimes think the trouble with middle America is they never go any place. They think they're the center of the world, and they're not, because the world is a big place. There are as many centers. And unless you've been to a big city, I used to think the problem with Americans would be solved if you could take all the people in the big city and put them in the country for six months. Take all the people in the country and put them in New York City for six months. A lot of problems would disappear. They would begin to understand what people are really like and how complicated the whole scene is. And they would lose a lot of their prejudice. I think that's really important in America, but it's, it's a dream. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so interesting. You mentioned uh, India and the color of people. Uh, people say to me, well, Hans, uh, you're with a woman of color. I said, what do you mean? I said, don't we all have color? They said, well, you're with a black person. I said, oh, well. And she, I said, there are hundreds of shades of black. She looks very chocolatey to me, you know, <laughs> blessed. <laughs> and so I'm, I feel I'm in the last phase of my artistic output. Right. And since my body has been injured from the heavy material moving, pushing to maxing and, you know, and breaking something. Yeah, yeah. I started to paint portraits, and they're called faces of many colors. Mm -hmm. And I do these abstract faces, put every color in it. But you notice a face, you see the eye, the nose, and the mouth. But those are like little attachments. Mm -hmm. And I'm really having fun with it. Uh, Good. Good. And I think to have fun with what you're doing that you laugh at yourself uh, is very healthy. Yes. I was also very fortunate to have been married to a most wonderful woman, Sief Cedaring, mm -hmm. who was a poet. And I learned so much from her. I learned from her about true love. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was incredibly kind and generous. And I always loved her creative moment. I would get up in the morning and make some coffee and she would stay in bed. And by the time I came up, she didn't eat breakfast, so I had breakfast. I came up and she would sit on the bed, in the middle of the bed, with 20 pieces of paper. And she, I said, what, what is all this? You know, she said, well, those are, little flurries of poetry that I see. I have to just put all the flurries together. Right. She said, but you know, I'm like a doctor. I can't read my own little notes. So <laughs> then I would sit there with her and decipher. Uh -huh. And that's how we shared each other, you know. Um, she, she would ask me, say, well, today, when I would come in and have to have dinner, she would say, well, what, what did you do today? I said, well, you know, I was on two journeys. One was the journey that to make the things. And the other journey was I was in a whole other world looking what, how could I expand my journey, my message to a larger people. Well, and it's, you know, <clears throat> being 85, which I am, it's hard to take yourself seriously anymore, <laughs> yeah. no matter what you're doing. 
because you know it, it's not going to last very long and you're just trying to you tried you know I still want to create I want to write and create things and I've been writing poems and people seem to like them and I publish them on Facebook I don't care whether they well they get seen by a lot of people they, they get seen by a lot of people and this this show gets seen by unexpected people you know it's LTV but it's kind of a quiet little show it's a corner they show it when they feel like it and uh, it works for me because people come up to me on the street and say I saw your interview with such and such a person I was so charming they say and that makes me feel good and more and more it's it's about giving things away I have 5,000 books that's too many books well <laughs> And I realized that uh, my children are going to be stuck with them. I sold all the rare books because they wouldn't know a rare book from a, from a comic book. But uh, it's not about things anymore. It's about what's going on in your life and how you feel about your surroundings and the other people in your life. And it really pays. You have to be kind. You always have to be kind. And I think once you master that, once you stop complaining about stuff and putting yourself and once you put yourself in another person's shoes and understand what they're going through, it really changes everything about you. And it makes you a better person. And that's what we're here for, I guess. We're coming to the end, by the way. We, you and I have had a wonderful conversation. At least I've enjoyed it enormously. I hope you have too. And we've talked about a lot of things that uh, we have been both on both our minds for probably all our lives, you know, and about our creativity. And uh, it's it's been great. It's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Well, it's always a pleasure seeing you. I think you're a, an unusual mind. Uh, that's interesting. I once had a professor at college hold me back from class, a very small class, eight people. And he said, I want you to talk up more. You have an interesting mind. <laughs> and that was one of the high points of my college career to be told by a very, very intelligent Greek man who was an expert on pre-Socratic philosophy that I have an interesting mind. And I think it's true. I think it is an interesting mind because it's free. I don't care about what other people are thinking. I really think for myself. And I don't think that often is true in the world. But my mother taught me to be very independent. Very? Independent. Mm. Not to rely on other people. So, that's what I do. I've been talking here with Hans. He's an old friend. We're good, we're artists in, in in uh, how shall I say it? We're we're twin in a way. We both have the same kinds of concerns. We both want to create as much as we possibly can in the time that we have given to us. So, thanks for watching. See you another time. And thank you, Tony, for inviting me for this exchange. And I would love to see you again. We will. We'll make sure that happens. This is it? That's it. We're done, folks.